just before we begin the next part of our program, I just want to acknowledge that uh, a gentleman here that I've known most of his life, Andre Hitty, uh, the son of Suzanne and Andrew sitting there, and brother of Jamie. I've uh, got a lot of Hitties here because uh, <laughs> Andre's wife is, is, is here as well. Uh, but Andrew, uh, excuse me, Andre is the um, uh, Vice President at BMO on mergers and acquisitions as he uh, presides over, a small part of the business. But he's uh, helped us very much forge a good relationship, a, 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 a very uh, beneficial one for our Senior Scholars Symposium, uh, helping us produce an educational product from it which is what the apparatus at the end of the room is, is all about, and make this uh, a really great uh, event, not just for those who can attend, uh, but uh, for the many who might learn things from uh, what we hear. And Andre, we do thank the BMO very much. They've been good to us, and uh, I hope our relationship will continue. I just want them to acknowledge it. Okay, so your, our program has very good descriptions of our two speakers that we have, we are welcoming here because we are so pressed now for time. I urge you to read their credentials, their bios, but, and you will hear what they have to say, anything. So I'm not going to go through this now, and it's my pleasure to introduce Matt Rato, who is a professor at the University of Toronto's information faculty. So, so, hello. Um, so actually this is all just a little skit that um, I put on in order to illustrate, no, I'm, I'm kidding, it's not actually just a skit. Um, but, but in fact, what I wanna talk about today, and what I'm gonna talk with you about in relationship to uh, technology is, is the complexity of our technology relationships. And I think this illustrates it that, uh, quite well. It, that, that in fact, that, that technologies don't exist as purely technical systems, but in fact are deeply embedded in and participate in all sorts of social practices. So the ways in which a power adapter makes it into or doesn't make it into a particular bag or uh, how we work to resolve these kinds of problems, that's in fact actually the focus of my work, which is on looking at how society and technology relate and interrelate to each other in the production of our world. And so as part of my work, um, and this was actually a secret, I was going to do all of this at the end, but as part of my work, um, uh, I'm actually, uh, I do a lot of technical work, so people often assume that I'm in fact uh, an engineer, or a computer scientist, or sometimes they think I'm a doctor in medical fields, um, but I'm in fact a humanities scholar. That's, that's what my training is in. Um, uh, I was a, uh, I got involved in computers at a very, very early age, um, but my PhD is in a field called science and technology studies, which at the university that I uh, uh, attended, University of California, San Diego, it was a joint program between uh, history, sociology, philosophy, engineering, and computer science. And so it was a very, so, so I often run into this recognition problem, and, and in fact, we were having it a minute ago where I was uh, uh, being queried about, well, what do you want me to say about who you are and what you do? And I said, well, <laughs> you know, it's a bit of a complex story. But I think we all recognize these days that. Um, that technology and, and social systems are interrelated. Uh, I, I, uh, I, do a, I do a talk to entering students every year, uh, and it used to be that I would say that. I'd say, oh, well, you know, technology is, is social, and people would look at me like I was crazy. Now, when I say that, they still uh, look at me as if I'm crazy, but it's not because I'm, they're so surprised at that, but they're so surprised that I think that I need to tell them that because, of course, they participate in social media. Uh, they, they, uh, uh, they take care of their um, friendships and their social relations, we all do, through these mediated digital technologies. So 
Um, I think I was just lucky in a sense that that was the focus of my work, uh, dating back almost 20 years now, was on specifically the interaction of digital systems and social worlds. And the example that I'm going to give you if we ever, if we ever get to it is a, is a particularly odd one, uh, which is the use of 3D printing uh, as a way of solving critical medical issues in the developing world. But before, and as, as I continue to riff for time here, can I ask um, how many people in this room know what 3D printing or additive manufacturing is? So we've got a fair amount. Um, there's a few uh, hands down, which of course gives me the excuse to you know, pontificate about it. But basically what 3D printing is, is um, I'll, I'll give you two versions of it. So one version of 3D printing that people often talk about is something like the Starship Enterprise uh, replicator. So this is a device that uh, you walk up to if you're Jean-Luc Picard, who's the Starship cap captain. You, you, it's a box in the wall. You walk up to it and you say, Earl Grey hot. And miraculously in front of you, a cup of tea uh, emerges. So that's one version of what people think of 3D printing. Of course, it's an inaccurate version because that's not what happens. Um, uh, it's not hot. It's not, well, there's a number of things. It's not hot. It's not tea. You know, I mean, there's, um, instead what a 3D printer is, uh, is a device which taking a digital file reproduces the shape. That's great. Reproduces the shape. Yay! <laughs> Drew, by the way, and I just want to highlight the sociality of that experience, which was deeply social and technical. Anyway, um, so what a 3D printer does is it takes a digital file and it uh, creates an object with that file, with, that, with the shape. So it doesn't create tea, it doesn't create ceramic, it doesn't create any of those things, it creates just shapes. Mostly it does that out of plastics or various types of polymers. And uh, that's what I'm going to be talking about is the ways in which those kinds of devices, um, uh, we've been utilizing, utilizing them to uh, produce prosthetics for children in the developing world. So, um, I think I can get a clicker here, maybe. Does that work? Does that part work? Get it all, uh, yeah. By the way, is anybody live tweeting this event? It's a, it's a little joke. This is one of the problems I have nowadays when I give talks, which is uh, there's people that are actually literally streaming out what I am saying as I say it, often incorrectly. So I'm glad you're not. Yeah. Okay. So um, as I as I've been kind of riffing on, uh, what I'm going to be really talking about here is engineering socio-technical systems, not just technical systems. And my secret was at the end I was going to come clean and say I was a humanity scholar. So maybe I'll still do that. Um, but what I really want to talk about is the ways in which that humanities background connected with technical capability create systems which actually can really solve critical issues. Um, the way that, oops, oh no, is that me? Okay, I'm, that, I'm, that's a user error, sorry, sorry. pilot error. Um, the, ways in, way, the way in which I often translate humanities knowledge uh, into these, these types of engineering practice is by talking about a value-driven approach. And some of these that you see up here on the screen are some of the starting points for the work that we're doing on prosthetics. And I'll be describing these, some of these in more detail as I go through the talk. Um, let me give you a bit of context. So based uh, on research that was carried out in my lab, which is located on the seventh floor of the Robards Library, strangely enough, um, uh, we uh, generated NIA, which is a nonprofit startup that takes research done here in the university and deploys it more broadly uh, out into the world, particularly with a focus on the use of 3D printing to solve critical problems. These are just some of the people involved uh, in that work and some of the partners involved. And, and as I think you're going to find out as I go through this project, this is not just merely a university project. This is not merely um, a project, uh, again, of just uh, uh, developed world partners, but is deeply partnered with uh, entities in the developing world. So like all solutions, like we saw a few minutes ago, there's a lot of people involved uh, from a lot of different walks of life and a lot of funders. Um, so where does the problem start? Well, it turns out that there is this incredible problem in the developing world, and that's basically 
basically access to prosthetic or orthotic aids, particularly to assist with walking and mobility. It's almost 30 million people that require them uh, and growing every, uh, every year. Um, but the problem is that the clinical population that actually makes and produces these devices, known as prosthetists orthotists, or prosthet prosthetic, prosthetists or orthotists, um, are, there's very few of them. There's very few of them globally, in fact. Even in uh, uh, Canada, there are only two training programs, one in Vancouver and one in Toronto, and they train about 15 or 16 people a year that come out, um, and, that's, and, and that's it. That's, that's in the entire country. And as, as you'll see in some of the other countries we're operating in, the, that population is even smaller. Um, because of this, and because of the, the difficulty and time-consuming uh, nature of producing devices uh, that, that can assist people, uh, less than 15% of that 30 million typically receive a device that can help them walk. That means they're either in a wheelchair or they have no mobility aid at all. Um, our work uh, that we've been uh, uh, doing focuses on children, explicitly focuses on walking, because of the knock-on effects of a loss of mobility to children, and these are just a few of them here. Um, there's a difficulty uh, accessing education. Um, there are difficulties socializing for children that are, that are not able to walk. Um, the caretakers of those children have more uh, time that they need to spend doing that caretaking activity. Um, and there are these, because of that, there are these direct, indirect, and long-term economic costs. By the way, this slide was done for some of my funders who are very interested in economic costs. I'm more interested in the social costs, but in fact, they're deeply, they're deeply, deeply tied together. Um, needless to say, if a kid can't walk, they are really uh, outside of society, particularly in these countries uh, where there aren't a lot of social programs or, or ways for them to be re-socialized into society. And after a certain age, that, that's a path-dependent problem. They, 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 they don't come back. It's difficult for them to come back. So I'm going to show you a short video. I might have to do it from the laptop there about some of our work, and then I'll, I'll give you some more details explicitly about, about, what we're, uh, about what we're up to. Is there a button there? And I don't know who's handling the audio in the back, but if you could play through the computer audio. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. It's... For, for some reason, it's for some reason that video isn't playing properly on that new computer. So um, what I'll do is uh, I can send you a link to uh, take a look at this video at another time, if you if you'd like to. Well, all what it was going to show you basically was our work uh, in these different clinical settings uh, around the developing world, um, and I was going to give you a, a, bit, a better sense of the patient populations that we're we're treating and the and the entities that we're dealing with. Instead, I'll just kind of describe that to you uh, here as I'm talking. Um, what we have ended up doing, and this is just really a summary of everything before I, I it's okay. We don't, we don't need that anymore. It's okay. Um, uh, thanks a lot. Um, what we've ended up doing is we've basically uh, provided equipment to four different clinic clinics in three different countries and are currently just about to complete the largest clinical trial of 3D printed prosthetics uh, ever, and it's actually one of the largest trials of prosthetics actually ever as well, since, since those trials don't tend to have a lot of patients. Um, the technology that we've de developed, which I'll show you some pictures of here in a minute, so things are a bit reversed, basically makes it possible to produce a prosthetic device in one day, where the current process takes at least one or two weeks. What that means is that a prosthetist can produce about 400 times, uh, has about an increase of about 400 times productivity in their clinical setting, which means that they can treat a, a, a lot more children, a lot more patients. Um, the other thing that this allows uh, is shorter hospital times. So, so patients who would normally have to stay at the hospital longer are able to come into the hospital, get their device, and go, go back out again. Um, and then there's some other effects, such as the, such as safety of those of that equipment. So, what this means is that we're involved in innovation, and we have a value of innovation. We believe that technology can create positive change, um, as you've, as I've said. And and really, the main technical change that we are interested in is helping clinicians 
move from the plaster room uh, to, the, to the design and printing studio. So since I haven't shown you the video, let me give you a little sense of what the, the standard prosthetic or orthotic process looks like. What it involves is uh, basically a patient presenting, let's say missing a, the lower part of their leg, um, being cast with a plaster cast in the same way that we might cast a, a, le a broken leg. That plaster cast is taken off the patient, dried, and then filled with plaster to make a plaster positive. That plaster positive is then dried. The plaster on the outside of it is manipulated by the clinician in order to create the right shape for a prosthetic. And then that plaster positive is wrapped with plastic to make a kind of an envelope or socket for the leg. And then that socket is integrated with a pylon, a stick, and a foot to create a full prosthetic device. Um, what that involves is a lot of this. So a lot of time in the plaster room, a lot of time waiting, a lot of manual labor. And what we've done is we've created a purely digital tool chain, which basically replaces the casting process, or that typically where you wrap it with plaster, with a digital scan using a handheld device. So using a handheld device, the clinician basically walks around the patient and captures a digital file that is the shape of the patient's residual limb. That file then goes into a computer and using a computer program that we wrote, it is manipulated to create the proper shape of the socket. That shape is then sent to a 3D printer where the shape, you know, relatively miraculously appears printed in nylon. And then that socket is taken out of the printer and integrated with the pylon and foot and fit on the patient. So what we've done is we, we've reproduced the same kind of process that the prosthetist orthotist does, but we've moved it into the digital, digital space. And in that movement, we've reduced the time from basically five days to approximately, really it's about an hour and a half of clinician time followed by about 10 hours of printing time. So that's, that's the work that we've been doing. And you can see here one of our client sites, uh, which is at CCBRT Hospital in Tanzania. The, the, the weird kind of green pieces you see in the front there and the black shapes, those are actually parts of 3D printers that we're looking through the 3D printer at the uh, prosthetist orthotists who are working on the laptops to basically develop these, uh, develop these sockets. This is what the scanning process looks like. So this is actually at Korsu Hospital in uh, Uganda, um, uh, near Entebbe. And you see the, the uh, there's two different scanners being used here. But on the left-hand side, uh, one of the clinicians is scanning the patient and scanning that residual limb. On the uh, right-hand side, uh, the, that's a, a, a newer scanner that we've developed, which uses a handheld tablet as the basis of the, of the work. Um, it's gone, it, the file goes into software, uh, modeling software, and you can see there the residual limb up on the screen. That's the, that's the piece that using the mouse, the, the clinician rotates and manipulates in order to create a socket. We also use some components that we build in other software. This actually is because I, I, I should have taken this slide out. Um, I, last time I did this presentation, I did it for Autodesk, and I had to, who's one of my funders, so I had to show them that I use their, uh, their software. So I'm pointing to the politics of doing this kind of work. That's what the socket ends up looking like. That's uh, in another piece of software that we have. Um, and then from that, it's uh, sent to 3D printers. In our case, we use two 3D printers operating simultaneously, one printing the bottom and one printing the top in order to reduce the printing time and to create, create more reliability because the context that we're in often have power variations and power problems. So, um, by printing two, one on each side, even if one, one part fails, we still only have half as much left to print. Those printers, by the way, cost about, the whole, the whole thing, just so you get a sense of it, the whole thing costs about $6,000 of capital equipment. So not too expensive. The key thing, though, and this is really what I want to highlight here, is uh, I don't make prosthetics. People often think I make prosthetics. I don't make prosthetics. I make tools, or NIA makes tools, which allow prosthetists and clinicians who have the proper clinical training and background and know-how um, to uh, make prosthetics. So just as a good prosthetic made manually 
is made by a pros prosthetician. A good prosthetic made digitally is still made by a prosthetician, not by us. There's a couple of reasons for, for why we focus on practitioners uh, providing skills and equipment to practitioners. Um, one is that, that it's, that it's uh, necessary and it's a good, uh, uh, devices are made by people with the, with the right clinical knowledge. Um, uh, and, and in fact, these are all trained people out in these clinics that, are, that we're now training to use a different modality of, of uh, development rather than the one that they've known before. Um, but the other is that in that design process, which we might think of as a, just a, mainly a technical process, there are clinically relevant decisions that people are making. And I'm just going to show you one. Uh, so in our software, a lot of the stuff that we're doing is automating the process. So this is something that typically people do with computational systems. You automate, you, you know, let's, let's reduce the need for the human labor, right? Let's get rid of the human labor. That's what the AI thing is all about too these days, it seems. Um, our goal is to make a clear distinction between the type of labor that in fact can be automated and the type of labor where a human needs to intervene and make the right decision. And this is just one example of it. See that? So that's a, that's a socket there. I hope, hopefully you can see it there in the back. Um, and below it is a disk. Um, that disk is actually a standardized piece, which is going to connect the custom shape, because that shape up above is entirely custom, with the standardized components which are made in other processes. So those other components always have the same, are always shaped the same. And we've got to somehow connect the standard and the custom. So that shape connects the two. But in fact, how that shape fits and how the socket is aligned with the rest of the material is a clinically relevant piece of knowledge. So yeah, we could automate it. We could just push a button and the whole thing is just produced. But in fact, clinicians need to set what they call the alignment to the cup. So, we're at, so, we, so we, we drop out of the process, the modeling process, the automated stuff, and they're able to move that thing around. However, once they've got it in the right spot, integrating it, so now it's integrated into the whole model, that's just, that's just, uh, that, that's something that can be automated. That's not clinically relevant. So in our process, we spend a lot of time, I mean, an inordinate amount of time, figuring out where does the clinician, where does the person need to make a decision, and where can the computer make it for them? And, and I, I think you know where I'm going since I predicated this with this socio-technical notion, but I'll come back to this at the end. After that is made, it's integrated with these Red Cross components. I've been kind of describing that already. Um, and of course, we do this work with partners, with partners in sites, uh, our offices, obviously. I don't know if you can see that in the back of this. We need a new image here. But we have our sites, uh, our offices, obviously, are in Toronto. And then our sites are in Uganda, uh, Cambodia, and Tanzania, two, two different sites in Tanzania. Here are some images of our work. So our first clinical trial was at Korsu Hospital in Uganda, where we fit 30 kids. You see Rosalind up there on the screen. She's a four-year-old girl, congenitally born, missing her right, uh, uh, missing her right foot. Um, she was our first, first uh, person fitted. Uh, and then we fit another 34. And then we went back to Korsu, and we fit another 30 kids with prosthetics and 30 with AFOs, ankle foot orthoses, which is a kind of a brace, which is also in, in a lot of need. Uh, we then went to Cambodia to CSPO, the Cambodian School for Prosthetics and Orthotics, and did 30 legs and 30 braces there. And we did our fourth trial at CCBRT Hospital and TATCOT, which are two separate sites in Tanzania, where we fit another 30 and 30. So for total, we're basically about 200 kids. And we've got about two more weeks, and then the trial is completely finished. Um, more images of, that's Ruth working with Jenin. Jenin is one of the prosthetists there getting fitted. Um, uh, Jenin and Moses working on Ruth there uh, in June a couple of years ago now, I guess. Samson with his AFO. He was the first patient we fit with an AFO there and his grandmother in the background. And uh, uh, orthotists in Cambodia as well working on a 3D printed uh, device. And some people walking, walking in them as well. Now, okay, so that's a lot of technical stuff, but I think you have a sense of what the work is. What, what about this is social? 
What about this is necessarily social, right? Why couldn't this just be a straightforward engineering project? Well, I, can, I think I can illustrate that best with a, short, with a little story, which is when we first started working on this, the assumption that everybody made, in fact, we sort of made it too, was the way this system would work is basically we'd send a scanner and a printer out to these sites. The people in those places would scan the patient with the digital scanner, send the file back to us here in Toronto. We would do all that modeling and converting and make the socket model, which is actually pretty complicated technical work, and then we would send that model back to the clinical site where they would print it. Well, upon reflection, we realized what a terrible solution that was. Terrible not because it wasn't instrumentally good, not because it didn't solve the immediate problem, not because it didn't produce potentially okay devices and fill this need, but problem, problematic because it reproduced the uh, power dynamics and you know cultural divides that exist between the global north and the global south. Uh, I'll tell you it in a slightly different, using a slightly different set of language. If we had built the system that I just described to you, basically we would have built a system where the black people do the manual labor and the white people do the intellectual labor. Does that sound? I mean, that does not sound like a good system, right? And in fact, it's both not good because of issues of social justice and equity and all the rest, it's also a completely unsustainable system because it in fact drains out of those contexts expertise and capability. It solves one problem and creates all these additional ones. So this I actually think of as the best example of why it is so necessary when we're building these kinds of systems to think about them not just from a technical point of view but also from a social point of view and leveraging what we know from the humanities and social sciences about sociality, about social context, about how people operate, and bridging that and connecting that to the technical knowledge as well. And, and for me, I'm so happy that this project has been successful and is working, but for me, it's also a, a great sign, I think, of how increasingly in the university we are figuring out ways to bridge across what is often called the great divide. Uh, between, in a sense, engineering, the natural sciences, and humanities, and social sciences. And, and really, that's what I think of as the real success of this, of this story. Thank you. Thank you so much. Is that good? How did I do on it time? perfect. <laughs> we have a little present. Oh, thank you. And in case you would rather exchange it at the University of Toronto. <laughs> I never. I'll read days. it right away. 30 days. Great. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm just going to talk. So the one issue that I think every single person in this room had thought about regarding technology, digital improvements in our lives is how it affects our privacy. Just as an example, my husband and I are going to Texas next couple of weeks in the future and I made direct reservations in a hotel called Lumen in Dallas. And ever since that day, I am getting offers, unrequired and unrequested offers from 16 other hotels offering me cheaper, better services. So this is in a way, I feel, an invasion of my privacy because I've never looked for it, never asked for it. And I'm sure that we all thought about privacy how we balance it with security. So there are a lot of unanswered questions and it is my pleasure to invite one of the leading experts in the world on this issue, Anne Kovakian, who is the director of the Ryerson University's um, Privacy and Big Data Institute to tell us her view on the problems of our privacy. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is such a pleasure to be here, and I thank you for inviting me to speak to you today. I'm just going to wait until my slides come up. Um, and then I have a lot of slides, and there's quite a bit of verbiage on the slides. 
it's really for you to take away if after we go away, you want to be reminded of what we talked about. You can have a copy of the slides or you can ignore them. I don't want you. Oh, how is this? All right, I'm going to speak up. I was just saying, uh, don't. Okay. So if we could have a, an individual. Someone's there. Okay, so I'm going I'm to just make small talk. <laughs> I'm sure you've all been um, watching in an interesting way the development south of the border uh, and what's happening with the executive order that uh, President Trump tried to introduce, which has not worked very successfully yet. And a few things that happened last week, the, um, the former uh, chair of the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, had introduced a very strong privacy protective ruling, which unfortunately got undone last week. And uh, there are a number of things going on that are giving uh, people um, pause in terms of what's happening to our privacy. And whenever we go through times like this, and it happens frequently, I always tell people, you never give up. It is most regrettable when unfortunate things and setbacks happen in terms of privacy, and I'll explain to you why I think you should consider it to be important. But it's like a chess game. It's like point-counterpoint. It's never just one event, and then that's the end of it. So many of my friends call me whenever there's a setback, and they go, oh, so I guess that's it, huh? I say, are you kidding me? What do you mean that's it? It's a step back. Here are the three things we have to do to get to the next step, to move it forward. What you never do is you never give up. See? There it is. We've already... <laughs> and we're going to get to the next slide in a moment. Privacy is so important. Uh, if you value your freedom, then you value privacy. Privacy forms the foundation of our freedoms. It's not just a human right. It's all about freedom and liberty. Let me see if I can get this going. Thank you so much. Well, we have your slides, but not the clicker. We're getting there, one step at a time. Next will be the clicker, and then we're going to be there. And I know I stand between you having wine. So I'm, I know this is a problem. I apologize for that. I'll make it as fast as I can. I always like to start by dispelling some myths. There's a lot of myths about what privacy is and what it is not. Daphne, thank you so much. Sorry. No. See? We're going to dispel the myths. The first myth I like to dispel, people think, oh, privacy is all about secrecy. You know, if you have nothing to hide, then you have nothing to fear, right? Wrong. It is complete opposite. I always think that um, that could have been the slogan of the Stasi police in the Third Reich in Germany. because. It assumes that the state has a right to know everything about you. And if you're a law-abiding citizen, what's the problem? The problem is that's not what freedom is about. Freedom is about you deciding how you want your personal information used. Freedom is all about personal control. You get to decide what information you want to disclose to whom and how you want them to use it. Freedom of choice is absolutely critical to privacy. The Germans actually, I should tell you, the, the Germans are amazing. Germany is the leading privacy and data protection country in the world. And it is no accident they had to endure the abuses of the Third Reich where they had a complete cessation of all of their privacy and the removal of all of their freedom. When that ended, they said never again, never again will we allow anyone to take away our privacy and our freedom. They came, the term informational self-determination is a term the Germans developed. In fact, they considered it to be such an important value, they enshrined it as a right in their constitution in 1983. It means that the individual should be the one to de determine the fate of his or her personal information. It's your information. You should decide, not your spouse, not your mother, not your parents, not your kids, nobody else. You're supposed to be the one who decides. And context is absolutely critical to that. And I'll give you an example. I often use myself in, in, as an example here. 
I think most people would agree that health information, medical information, is the most sensitive personal information out there. No one has ever disagreed with that. In 2004, so before uh, I joined Ryerson, I was the Privacy Commissioner of Ontario for three terms, a long time, almost 20 years. And in 2004, Ontario introduced an excellent bill called uh, PHIPA, the Personal Health Information Act. It's all about protecting your personal health information, and it was just brilliant. It was a brilliant model, and I went around doing what I often do, talking to stakeholders to ensure that the bill got actually passed into law. And after about the second or third talk, I was really surprised. I usually get a, a good reaction in my talks, and I noticed I wasn't getting through to the audience, doctors, hospitals, um, stakeholders, etc. And I was really worried about this because this was such an important bill. It had to be passed. So midway, I think through my third talk, I just stopped and I said, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to ask for your help. Please tell me what I'm doing wrong because I see I'm not getting through to you. And I really need to get through to you because this is vitally important. Please help me. And some young, wonderful doctor stood up and he said, look, you're probably a good privacy commissioner, but you don't know what it means to be a patient. You don't know, and I got it. He thought I was only speaking as a privacy commissioner with privacy being the only thing on my mind. He thought I didn't know the needs of patients in healthcare. And I knew what I had to do, and I was the only one who could do it. No one else would ever do this. I said, are you kidding me? You think I don't know what it means to be patient? Do you know how many neurosurgeries I've had? I have been in and out of the hospitals. I have a pump in my head and a shunt, a tube that runs down here, and I've had multiple neurosurgeries, and no doubt will continue to in the future. Don't tell me I don't know what it means to be patient. The guy, his jaw dropped, and then I thanked him profusely. I said, thank you for pointing out to me. You think I'm speaking to you only as a privacy commissioner. I I'm speaking on behalf of all patients and the delivery of healthcare services, nothing could be more important. But what if I can give you healthcare services with a cloak of privacy wrapped around it? What if I can give you privacy and the delivery of healthcare services? Never one versus the other, but both. That changed everything. Everybody started seeing me as a patient who cared deeply about privacy, but of course, put the delivery of healthcare services first. And my doctors, who I absolutely love, uh, you know, I'm often at social functions with them, and, and I'll go up to them, I'll say, this is my wonderful neurosurgeon, this is my neurologist, I love these guys. They won't admit they're my doctors. That's how much they protect my privacy. <laughs> it's context. That's the context that only the individual can decide what they choose to reveal and to whom. It's absolutely vital. Privacy is also essential to freedom. And I was saying, I have a lot of language up here. You can ignore it all because I'm going to talk to you about it. This is for future reference if you ever want to refer to it. It's made available. What people think privacy holds back creativity and innovation, it does the exact opposite. It breeds innovation and creativity. It grows prosperity. And it's not privacy versus security or privacy versus prosperity, economics, it's how do you do both. It's absolutely vital for society. In the absence of it, surveillance is the antithesis of privacy. When people are looking over your shoulder, and I use the Stasi um, in the Third Reich in Germany as an example, it completely inhibits your cognitive bandwidth. Uh, forgive me for using that language, I'm a psychologist. I graduated from UT many years ago, and. Uh, I've never forgotten the impact it has when people think they're being watched. It inhibits creativity and it does everything that we don't want it to do. So I want to give you the message of what we can do today and grow in terms of privacy. It's something I created years ago when I was a commissioner. I call it privacy by design. And it's all about embedding privacy into the design of our technologies, our policies, our operations, in a way that you can prevent the privacy harms from arising. It's a model of prevention, much like a medical model. And it was unanimously passed as an international standard in 2010. Privacy commissioners have an international conference once a year, usually in Europe. In 2010, it was in Israel, it was in Jerusalem. And at the end of a three or four day conference, we have a half day uh, session where it's a closed session and commissioners introduce resolutions that the uh, delegate, uh, delegates vote on. And that year I introduced a 
resolution for privacy by design, that we use it to complement regulatory compliance, privacy laws, which always kick in after the fact. The model of privacy and data protection is someone uh, files a complaint to the commissioner, the commissioner investigates, and if they find in favor of the complainant, then they issue some edict or order um, which will offer a remedy in the future. But the harm has already taken place. It's a model that kicks in after the fact, and it's simply no longer sufficient. What surprised me was that this resolution was unanimously passed by my colleagues, because most of my colleagues are what I call lawyers' lawyers. They love drilling down into the law, section 29, sub 2, part B, and applying the law to the fact situation. Works beautifully. The problem is, it's limited. It's based on knowing what the harm is and having someone come forward with it. What I realized that my fellow commissioners realized is that we were only seeing the tip of the iceberg in terms of the privacy harms. In this day and age of ubiquitous computing, online connectivity, social media, the majority of the harms were escaping our detection. Certainly, we weren't being able to address them. And so we needed something upfront, proactively, to complement regulatory compliance after the fact. And that's why privacy by design grew. And it's grown dramatically. It uh, has a real global presence now. It's been translated into 39 languages. And the essence of it is that you're proactive, you address the issues up front, you try to prevent the privacy harms from arising by embedding privacy protective measures into the code, if you can, into the policies, the procedures, into the data architecture. It's a model of prevention. The second aspect that is absolutely critical is it changes it from a zero-sum game to a positive-sum model. Zero-sum means you can have one interest versus another. You can have privacy or security, privacy or health care. That is the most destructive model, and I can assure you zero-sum just means you have an increase in one area, always to the detriment of the other, so that the two total to a sum of zero. And I'll never forget when I was at U of T in the psychology department, Anatole Rapoport, one of the big big minds of game theory uh, was there and I studied this and it was amazing. And people just sort of gravitated to zero sum models because they're easier, one versus the other. I being the eternal optimist thought, wouldn't it be better if you could have two interests? You could have privacy and security, privacy and healthcare. It's as simple and as difficult as getting rid of versus and substituting and. We call it the power of and. And this will change everything. And it is extremely difficult to do at times, but the end result is amazing. So this is what I have been advancing for many years. We've had a lot of success with it. I'm not going to go into, there are seven foundational principles to privacy by design. I'm not going to go into all of them because we are limited in time. I've already covered a number of them. I want to just talk about number two for a moment. Privacy is the default setting. What that means is the existing model now is you as a customer or um, an employee, anyone, you scour the privacy policy and the terms of service if you go to a website or something, and you find, after you go through all the legalese, the opt-out box, which says, don't use my information that I've just given you for any purpose other than the purpose that I gave it to you, the primary purpose. The problem is this. Nobody has time or the inclination to wade through dozens of pages, trying to find out the opt-out box and say, just use my information for the purpose intended. But that's what people want. They're giving you information, not for you to do whatever the heck you want with it. They're giving it to you for this particular purpose. You order something from Amazon, you have to pay them, of course. You give them your credit card. You give them your home address if you want them to deliver it to you. End of story. We know it's not the end of the story, but theoretically, that's supposed to be it. Privacy as the default flips it on its head. It does the exact opposite. It says, we, the company you've given it to, whoever, we're only going to use your information that you've given us for this primary purpose, the one intended. That's why you gave it to us, right? Right. We're going to give you privacy assurance right from the get-go. We're not going to use it for any other purpose. And if we want to use it in the future for a secondary use, we'll come to you and ask for your positive consent. It flips it on its head. It is the most challenging and the most rewarding of the foundational principles. I'm going to 
Now remember this, because I'm going to come to it in just a minute. Uh, just in case you think this sounds interesting, but it's pie in the sky, it'll never happen, it's a theoretical construct, au contraire. When I was commissioner, it had to walk on the ground right then and there. Things develop so quickly. So these are 11 areas that we've applied privacy by design, working with all of the major tech companies. Think of any major tech company, Microsoft, Intel, IBM, HP, Oracle, just there's so many. We worked with them all because we wanted to show that this was real and you could actually do it on the ground. You could make it work. And these companies were very strongly invested in wanting to make this work because they want you to use their technologies and preserve your privacy. Privacy is at an all-time high right now. After Edward Snowden's revelations, interest in privacy skyrocketed. I'll never forget uh, 20, 2014 and 15, Pew Internet Research and three other, uh, two other organizations, there were three surveys out. For the first time ever in my life since I've been doing this, over 20 years, the concern for privacy was in the 90 percentile. 90% of those uh, polled were very concerned about their privacy. Another one was 91%, another one was 90%. And they were so fearful about the, their lack of control over their information. So companies and governments are very poised, very interested in offering privacy protection to people. Just so you know, there are countries that do a very good job of this. One is uh, Japan. Japan was an early adopter of privacy by design. And I got this letter from them just before I finished my last term as commissioner. And it was from JIPTEC, the Japanese Information Processing Development Center. And they were wedded to this. And I thought if they could understand the language of positive sum versus zero sum and embrace what is offered by positive sum privacy by design, then I thought the rest of us could also figure this out. So we've had great success. Now, I'm gonna give you an example of what's happening in the European Union right now, and this is very instrumental. There's something called the General Data Protection Regulation, the GDPR. It was passed last year, it's coming into effect next year, and it will just shake everything to the ground. Right now, each member country of the EU, the 28 member countries, they each have their own separate <clears throat> privacy laws. This is going to replace them. 28 privacy laws are going out, being replaced with one overarching law, the GDPR. That's huge. For the EU, that's really a big deal. The other big deal that comes with the GDPR is for the first time ever, the language of privacy by design and privacy as the default actually appear in this new law. That's pretty big. And, we, and this is from Canada. So they know that. So they're consulting with us all the time. So it's very exciting to see this because what it will do is it will dramatically raise the bar on privacy. All of a sudden, you've got privacy by design, data protection by design, and I mentioned earlier privacy is the default, which is that really hard thing. It gives privacy assurance right from the beginning. They're gonna be doing this in the EU. It is amazing. And people are scrambling. Um, just very quickly, th there used to be something called the Safe Harbor Agreement, which was the, what preceded the GDPR, which is in existence now, the European uh, Privacy Directive. In the United States, their privacy laws aren't as strong as Canada's, although Canada's has to be strengthened for the GDPR. They're certainly not as strong as the EU. So what they had in place was this thing called Safe Harbor Agreement, which basically meant that companies in the US, about 4,500 companies, could self-certify that they were gonna follow the elevated protections of the EU um, European Privacy Directive. And that was working quite well until after Edward Snowden's revelations, Max Schrems filed a court case, a challenge, to Safe Harbor. And he said, they're not doing it. They're saying that they're following our, our level of privacy, and they're not. It went through all the courts, and the European Court of Justice found in favor of Max Schrems an invalidated, outright invalidated Safe Harbor Agreement. Gone in November 2015 just gone. So everyone's scrambling in the US, these 4,500 companies, what are we gonna do? We still wanna engage in trade and business with the European Union countries. So they've, they've been scrambling, they, they formed something called the Privacy Shield, which is unlikely to get off the ground, although they're working back and forth. Suffice it to say, uh, the one thing 
that everyone has been turning to is privacy by design because that is something that the U.S. companies know about and that they can do right now and demonstrate to the EU that they're at least trying to comply with the GDPR. Now, I would not be so bold as to say this, but Information Age uh, last year in 2015 said um, it's not too much of a stretch to say that if you implement privacy by design, you've mastered the GDPR. I think that's going too far. However, uh, I've had a lot of calls, I assure you, from American companies who are very interested in saying, how do we do this privacy by design thing? We do want to show the Europeans we are interested in doing this. So this is the good news. I always like to give good news, bad news, but I always end on a good news, so don't worry. What I've noticed in the last little while is possibly is the tide turning towards greater surveillance. And this concerns me enormously uh, for all the obvious reasons, given my interest in privacy. Um, this started in the United Kingdom. They passed something colloquially referred to as the Snoopers Charter. It's the Investigatory Powers Bill. This is the most surveillance um, positive bill imaginable. There is a petition to repeal the new law. It, it, unlikely it will not work. But uh, Theresa May's bill basically allows uh, companies to store customers' web histories, make records available to the police, um, write all kinds of interception models by uh, spying agencies without anyone being given notice and certainly no notion of consent. It is extremely, extremely damning. And and it passed. So then you think, OK, well, that's the UK, you know, Brexit, they've pulled out. Last year, I chaired a, a conference in London, England, uh, just like a week after Brexit had happened. And it was astounding. Certainly in London, nobody thought Brexit was going to happen. That's, they didn't vote for it because they just assumed it wasn't going to happen. And then, boom, it happens, and everyone is going nuts. They don't know what they're going to do. They don't like it. That's another story. Worse than the UK, though, Germany, who I told you is the strongest leading country in terms of privacy and data protection. There's a, a new uh, draft law that was just released by um, Germany. And part of this is fueled by, uh, I think, Angela Merkel, who has been very uh, open and receptive to refugees and welcoming them. There's, she's getting a lot of backlash. So now there's this new law. Uh, it's not a law, let me be clear. It's a bill that would limit the government's own data protection methodologies and procedures, which are extremely strong. When I saw this, it was, when was it? Yeah, November last year. I, I just couldn't believe it. I called my, my two colleagues in, the, in Germany, the Federal Data Protection Commissioner and the Data Protection Commissioner of Berlin, who I've worked with for many, many years. I said, I cannot believe this is happening. Tell me it's not true. They said, don't worry yet. They said, it's a bill. If Angela Merkel doesn't get reelected, the bill dies. I said, what if she gets reelected? They said, we have a very strong group opposing this. It is unlikely to become enacted into law. We are on top of it. I give it to you just as an example of how quickly things can move and flow and how we have to be very concerned about this. In the US, before President Trump, Obama, days before his term ended, um, he, he enacted these new rules that will allow the NSA uh, and 16 other agencies to share without court orders or congressional authorization an enormous amount of information. And this is private personal data. This has never happened before. It was astounding to everyone that President Obama would do this. So from quarters that you can't anticipate this kind of thing happens, and it is mind-boggling. So I give you these examples, and, and don't think we're immune. Oh, God, I wish we were. Um, before Prime Minister Trudeau became Prime Minister, he, the Harper government introduced something called Bill C-51. It's, it's, it's a horrible bill. It's a horrible law. And unfortunately, Justin Trudeau did not oppose it but what he said was, he said, if I become voted, if I am voted prime minister, I will change the bill dramatically and remove the surveillance parts of the bill, which basically allowed the government and the police to do a lot of things without any consent. So 
I believe he's been prime minister for well over a year. Has it not been that? He has not done one thing. Not one measure has been taken to repeal, withdraw the surveillance aspects of Bill C-51, despite many, many people writing to him, the Canadian Civil Liberties Organizations, I have, of course, I've written op-eds, lots of commissioners and others have written. No, no steps are taken. So I give that to you just as an example of how quickly things can change from promises made to promises kept. Now, let me continue. Why is this so important? When people think they're being watched, their information is being collected, there is this concept of self-censorship. And in a digital society like the one we are living in, if you think you're being watched, if you think that the government knows everything about you, it has an impact in terms of people censoring their own activities. And again, historically, we have seen this again and again. The, um, there's a term for it called scopophobia, which is all about people fearing being stared at, fearing being tracked, having information about them being compiled, and it engenders a lot of fear and the fear of being controlled. Now, you may think this is extreme, and perhaps it is, but this is a very real occurrence, and what I don't want in an open and free and democratic society such as ours, I don't want our freedoms to be fleeting and replaced by these kinds of fears. And we have to object to this kind of surveillance taking place. So I just want to make sure you're aware of that because when I talk, I'm going to switch to the Internet of Things. And the Internet of Things is like insane. The Internet of Things is, I break it down to three areas, wireless and wearable devices in terms of wearable computing, um, the quantified self, you know, the Fitbit and things of that nature and home automation where you've got the nest, uh, you've got um, electrical uh, thermostats, etc., that monitor themselves, and you're going to have the fridge talking to the stove, talking to God knows who. You're going to have all these smart devices. Here's what worries me about smart devices, and I, I always tell people, beware of all things smart in that sense, because what they don't have is they don't have any sense of control or allegiance to you uh, who presumably own these things. They, the whole thing of smart is that data is being sent somewhere. So data relating to your activities within the home. There's a lot of, you know, when we talked about um, self-driving cars and cars uh, and, and just all these new aspects of homes that are self-regulating. The data is going quickly to some other body. When you think of Internet of Things, I compare it to the Wild West. It's developing at a very fast pace. People are very excited about it. Information is flowing everywhere. There's no security and privacy built into this, not yet. So already, you're getting massive data breaches and lawsuits that are starting. And they're not just lawsuits, they're class action lawsuits because people are just learning what can happen to their information that is very revealing about their activities, for example, within the home. When you wake up, when you go to bed, when you watch TV, the shows that you watch, I hope none of you have a Samsung TV um, that is a smart TV, because what happens is you've got the voice activation, like you really can't use the remote to change it to another channel, I mean, apparently not. You say change it to channel 31, whatever. That voice activation um, module doesn't just pick up when you say change it to channel whatever, it picks up the conversations that are happening in your home. And all of that is going to Samsung. So the sweet nothings you say to your spouse, the heartfelt conversations with your children, all of this is being captured and going to Samsung. And you haven't a clue how it's gonna be used or to whom it may be leaked or anything. There's a huge backlash now because of that. But of course, no one is aware of that, it seems, in their excitement to buy these smart devices and systems. We have to open our eyes. 
Um, believe me, I'm not anti-technology at all because we're going to use technology to fix a lot of this. But in the zeal uh, to jump into these new technologies, that's why I call it the Wild West of the IoT, no one has been thinking about the security and privacy that should be built into these devices. That will come, but there's a lag, unfortunately. Uh, where's the privacy? Well, it's like non-existent. And a lot of people are now starting to look at this in a big way. And that's the good thing. Um, there are thousands of health and fitness devices, apps, um, but it, this says it's not always clear if the user's data is, data is kept confidential. I think the bet you can make, if you need to, is that it's not being kept confidential. Uh, here's a quote from Symantec. Earlier this year, Symantec analyzed a number of wireless wearable products. They found that all hardware-based devices were 100% trackable, all of them. And this is just the beginning. What are they saying about it? They're saying, well, privacy and security should be the default. Remember, privacy is the default setting. Uh, these, these devices should incorporate as a default standard-based privacy and security controls into their product infrastructures. None of them have them now. It's that remarkable. Uh, it's, it's just astounding to me, but this is my field. This isn't happening at all. In the US, the Federal Trade Commission looked at 12 uh, mobile health and fitness apps um, the, last year, uh, like the, your Fitbit, things of that nature. They found that of the 12 uh, health and fitness app developers were sharing user information with 76 different parties. These are unauthorized third parties that the users had no knowledge of, had certainly not consented to having their information shared with these 76 parties. So it just gives you an example of how much we really need to have a very strong privacy standard for the Internet of Things. And it's totally, totally lacking right now. This is the problem. But we're getting a lot of attention to it because now all the data breaches are happening. See, whenever you have information flowing to unauthorized third parties, they can do whatever they want with the information. So there's no controls, there's no protection, there's no security, and they do. They sell it to the highest bidder, they put advertising on it, etc. And then all of a sudden, the user, the individual to whom the data uh, relate, is saying, oh my God, how did they get that information? I think you were giving an example of your hotel. And all of a sudden, you got all these, <laughs> all these heads from these other hotels. How did they get my information? These are some of the problems that are just beginning to um, develop. Now, the good news is, so I, I, I'm always going to give you the bad news, good news story, and this is, it is like a chess game, it goes back and forth. In Europe, there's something called the Article 29 Working Party in the European Union. They're the group that looks at privacy and technology solutions. And what they recommended for the Internet of Things, they said, make privacy the default setting, follow privacy by design. And the 28 member countries of the EU listen to the EU 29 Working Party. So slowly, this is starting. We also have, privacy commissioners have a privacy conference once a year, as I mentioned. Um, in 2014 at the conference, they were looking at a number of things and they said privacy by design should be the key selling point to innovative technologies. And that's what I loved. It was presented as a positive. When I talk to businesses and companies, I say treat privacy as your greatest friend, because if you embed privacy into your operations, you design it in from the beginning, your customers will thank you for it. You will engender their trust, you engender consumer confidence and loyalty. Trust right now is at an all-time low in terms of privacy, both in terms of government and private sector operations. So if you lead with privacy, respect for your customers' privacy, you will get such a good result. I always say you will get a, com a competitive advantage over the other guys who aren't doing this. And more and more companies are beginning to do this. It's, it's a slow operation, but it's starting. And that's the good news here. They're getting that we just have to embed privacy into the Internet of Things, into wearables by design. The by design aspect is critical. It's all about, at the front end, think through what are the potential risks that can arise in terms of your information floating around. Identify the risks. Then you can build in mitigation. You can identify what you can do to protect that information. And when you do it by design, 
it just works so much more easily. The cost is a fraction of not doing it. And then you go to the end, and then you've got all these data breaches, you've got lawsuits. It is just a nightmare. So more and more people are doing it. One of the things in terms of Internet of Things is that engineers have to understand this. Um, right now, most engineers are still wrapped up in figuring out the basic infrastructure of IoT, et cetera. And unless someone directs them to embed privacy, it's not top of mind. The last year I was privacy commissioner, I spent a lot of time, went around the world, to, I called it the year of the engineer. And I went around talking to almost exclusively engineering groups and conferences. And I said to them, look, I am saying you can, you can embed privacy into the design of these structures, into the data architecture, into the procedures, the paw. Can you, can you really do that? I'm saying you can do it, the ones I've talked to, but I really need to be assured of that. I, I loved it. To a person, everyone said, of course we can do that. You know, we're smart. They're confident. That's exactly what you need. But they said, we're not the problem. I said, you've got to go talk to the executives who tell us what to do. We get the instructions to write the code to build the program. No one ever tells us to build in privacy. So we follow the instructions, we deliver it, and then someone says, oh, can you bolt on a privacy solution after the fact, after we finished the, and delivered the system? They said, look, we can try to do something. It's never going to be half as good as if we did it from the front end and build it, baked it into the structure of the system. So then I went around talking to CEOs and boards of directors. And I said, get rid of the silos. Your tech people have to hear from your policy people and your lawyers and your program people. You have to have this conversation up front at the same time. And you've got to be able to deliver on this, embed privacy into the process. This morning, I talked to, um, from 7 to 9 in the morning, if you believe it, uh, Institute of Corporate Directors. Because now, boards of directors are very concerned with this issue. Because they're saying, oh, my god, if I, do our fiduciary responsibilities extend to this area? You bet they do. No one said, we don't want to do it. What I heard, the feedback I heard was, we weren't aware of this issue. W what we need to do is raise awareness dramatically. That's what we're all trying to do. So I've got way too much left, so I'm going to go really quickly, because I know I tend to talk and talk. Um, servant or spy, the reason I want to just touch on this is artificial intelligence is growing dramatically. You're going to have a lot of, lot of uh, devices like Alexa, uh, Siri, uh, Echo. You're going to have all these devices that you just tell it, please do this, and it's going to go do this. Isn't that great? You're going to have this great assistant. How great is that? Well, maybe not so much, because they're on always, on all the time. They will basically know everything that's going on. And if you're not clear in terms of your instructions and what you want retained and what you don't, unless you really learn how to use these, um, your life is going to be an open book. Plus, I found this as a, a very funny story, Amazon's Echo Alexa. Um, also is connected uh, to, um, th they're connected to Amazon. So this, in this one place, this child, I don't know, eight or nine year old, was talking to uh, Alexa and said, I'd like a really beautiful dollhouse, a really big, beautiful dollhouse. Okay, okay. So what got delivered the next day? This magnificent dollhouse, which cost a fortune, I should add, because there were no restrictions on price given by the child. And the parents were saying, what the heck? What is going on here? These are some of the little details that you might not want to overlook. Not to mention, what about the police? Um, is it okay for them to know everything that's happening within your household? If you're, uh, you know, maybe you've got a child or a grandchild who's, you know, doing legal things but a little on the edge or whatever. Do you really want your personal conversations in your home captured and delivered to the police. That is your choice. The point is, if you want microphones everywhere, you're going to have them, unless you have some understanding of looking under the hood and figuring out what you're getting and what you're not getting. Uh, I hate this. Uh, I have seen the future electric, Alexa controls everything. No, say no to that. You have to be in control. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I started by saying privacy is all about control, personal control over the uses of your information, over the disclosure of your information. I'm not saying privacy is a religion. If you want to give away your information, be my guest. That is also your choice. But make an informed choice. Don't let the stuff be seeped out without you having any knowledge or awareness. I'm, I'm almost done, and I'm going to end on um, a positive note. I hope you think it'll be a positive note. I've just started a new international council, and the reason for it is a multiple reason. I've talked to you about the zero-sum proposition, that increasingly people think it's one interest versus another, that you can never have both. And I fought that all my adult life. What I've noticed in the last few years, though, is whenever you have an increase of terrorist incidents, starting with Charlie Hebdo, Brussels, San Bernardino, London, the pendulum swings right back to zero sum. Forget about privacy, we need public safety. Of course we need public safety, but not to the exclusion of privacy. You can have both. I've worked with so many law enforcement agencies who, in fact, I was just, um, last week I was in Arizona, at Arizona State University, we put on a colloquium, and they asked me if I could get a big security person to come and speak at the conference. And while I was commissioner, I worked with um, Michael Chertoff. He was the Secretary of Homeland Security, Second Secretary of Homeland Security in the United States, DHS. And I, I called him and I said, Michael, we're putting on this colloquium at ASU. I'd love it if you would come. And he said, of course. So it was wonderful seeing him again. We reconnected over all these issues. It, it melted my heart. His title, the title of his talk was Security and Privacy, colon, Better Together. It was totally from Michael Chertoff, positive sum, not zero sum. That warmed my heart. He is, um, you'll see he is one of the founding members of this new uh, Council on Global Privacy and Security by Design. And we have Jill de Kerchoff, who is the Director of Counterterrorism of the, of the European Union, he agreed. Uh, Darren Entwistle, who is the CEO of TELUS, and Greg Wolfund, who is the CEO of SecureKey. These are some of the people who readily agreed to become founding members and members of the Governing Council because they understand that we have to have both. We have to have both privacy and security. We have to have privacy and health care. We have to have it doubly enabling systems, not one to the exclusion of the other. If you value your freedom, you will value your privacy. And I say this as my background, I'm Armenian. Um, my, my grandparents lived through the Armenian Genocide, and my family values freedom more than anything else. My, my parents brought us here when I was four years old, and they gave up everything to raise their children in freedom. I have two older brothers, and I, have the, I live in gratitude for my parents, and uh, I just want to convey the view that you don't have to forfeit your freedom and your privacy for other things. You can and must have both. So let me end, ladies and gentlemen, on that note and just ask you to consider the possibilities of having all of the wonderful events, all of the wonderful technologies that are going to happen, and you can have privacy and prevent the harms from arising. We can do both. I have a lovely colleague in, in Germany, Kai Rannenberg. He says, you know, if most people are smart, they lead with privacy by design. But they're not ready for the most part. A lot of them just get privacy by chance. But the worst thing is getting privacy by disaster. Then you're going to have the regulator at your door. You're going to lose privacy. You're going to lose everything else. So get smart. Lead with privacy by design. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. So I would suggest that we are running out of time. There is a glass of wine and some cheese and whatever waiting for you in the other room. And we could try to resolve the question that was raised by the symposium perhaps between us, whether is it all good or bad or just different, this technological age that we ended up with. Thank you very much.